is here, so we can start the next talk a couple of minutes earlier. Uh, <laughs> next time. Right, so the next speaker is Jonathan Rondon from University of Oregon, and he will speak about show where duality and category creation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I also wanted to go to Olchansky's talk, so you be good. Um, so I'm going to be talking about categorification. Um, and uh, in Eric Vassero's talk a little bit earlier, he was also talking about this, this the same type of categorification. So there's a reasonable overlap there, but I'm going to try and recall some of the basic notions that, that were also in his talk. Um, so this word categorification, it, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible word, um, which has become very popular in the last 10 years or so, and, and there's lots of different flavors of categorification. <coughs> And the particular flavor that I'm talking about is, is this, uh, this, this categorification of representations of Lie algebras. So uh, I, I prefer to, to talk about categorical actions of Lie algebras um, on abelian categories. So this, this flavor of categorification, it really goes back to, I guess, Raphael Ruquier was, was the first person who really set it up very fully in an in a axiomatic framework. And that, that's that's uh, what I'm talking about here. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So G will be some uh, symmetrizable Katz-Moody Lie algebra. Um, and I'll write alpha i for the simple roots. So capital I is the index set for the simple roots. And the Chevrolet generates for G will be little e i and little f i. And the weight lattice is x. So I'm trying to tell you, to start with, what it means for G to act on a category. So what's a categorical action of G? So let's fix a category C. So I'm talking about abelian categories here. So C will always be some abelian category. And it should be decomposed as a direct sum of, of, of uh, C lambdas indexed by the set of weights. So these C lambdas, I'll call them the weight subcategories of the abelian category C. And uh, C should have some nice finiteness properties. So to start with, each of these weight subcategories C lambda it should just be just some category of modules over some finite dimensional algebra. And I'm working always over just some ground field K. It would be just fine if you thought K was the complex numbers for everything I'm doing. So we've got some big abelian category that's just some direct sum of uh, categories of modules over some bunch of, of finite dimensional algebras. And so we want to say what it means for, the, for this category Lie algebra G to act on this category C. So here's, here's the definition of categor categorical action of G on C. So uh, we need some endofunctors of this category C corresponding to the Chevrolet generators, EI and FI, of, of the Cax Moody G. So I'll, I'll use uh, big letters EI and FI for each. That simple root, there's a, there's a functor EI, which should go from the weight subcategory indexed by lambda to the weight subcategory indexed by lambda plus alpha I. And fi goes back again, so fi subtracts the simple root. And this pair of functors ei and fi should be bi-adjoint. In particular, they're exact. So uh, then I, I'm going to always use this notation c in the square brackets here for the uh, complexified Grothendieck group of this category. So this is just the complex vector space, which will have basis given by the classes of the indecomposable projectives in, in the civilian category c. So this is this is this Grothendieck group with the split Grothendieck group of projectives in the in the category C complexified. So these these func these biadjoint functors will induce just linear operators on the complexified Grothendieck group. And the first condition for having a categorical action is that this these E i and F i on the vector space C this should should be, be uh, have the structure of an integrable representation of the Cax Moody algebra G. So, so these E i and F i should satisfy the the Sayre relations for, for the Cax Moody Lie algebra coming from the root datum, and it should be integrable, so local nil potents. And the weight spaces of this uh, integrable G module should just be the Grothendieck groups of the weight subcategories. So the lambda weight space is just the, the Grothendieck group of the, um, lam of the lambda weight subcategory. Uh, so in this case, because each C lambda is modules over a finite dimensional algebra, each of the weight spaces are actually just finite dimensional. Later on, I'll have some examples where the weight spaces might be infinite dimensional, even though it's still integral. So that's rather naive 
first first guess as to what a categorical categorical action of G on C would be, just some exact functors satisfying the relations of the Kax Moody. And then the next axiom is some sort of higher structure. That's really the whole point of this game. We also want to have some natural transformations of these functors um, around, and there should, these natural transformations should satisfy some relations. So this is sort of higher categorical structure. So this is this is the second axiom. Um, so uh, the natural transformations that I want, I want an endomorphism of, of each of these functors fi. I call that xi. I think it was x in Eric's talk. And I also want some, uh, some homomorphism from fi fj to fj fi, so some intertwiners going between two neighboring f's. And I call these taus, I think they were sigmas in Eric's talk. So this is extra data that you need, this higher data to have a categorical action. You need a xi and a tau for each, <coughs> FI, each pair fi fj. And these natural transformations should satisfy relations, and the relations are the relations of the quiver Hecker algebra which also appeared in Eric's talk. So QHD is the Dieth quiver hecker algebra. And I'm not going to repeat the relations of this algebra. In fact, it's not very instructive for what I'm doing here to know what it is. Um, but just very, very roughly, when I think about the, the Dieth quiver hecker algebra, I like to think of its generators diagrammatically. So I draw these diagrams with D strands going down. And each of the strings in the diagrams, they're colored. The colors are, come from the same set i as labels as simple roots. So you see here fi, that's up to the color i there, fi, fj are colored. So the strands in these diagrams are colored by the simple roots. And then the, 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 the generator psi, I just represent with a dot on the, on the strand of color i, and the generator tau I represent as a crossing of the, of the strands of the, of the colors i and j. Um, and so then the quiver heck algebra is just some sort of kind of dotted um, diagrams with, with strings that are crossing. And I'm not going to write down all the relations again, but, but so, so these natural, these endomorphisms of the Fi's, if you put them all the Fi's together to get a single functor F, uh, and you look at the dth power of F, these natural transformations psi and tau will induce endomorphisms of F to the D, and those endomorphisms should exactly satisfy the relations of the D for the Quebec out. So this looks kind of a little mysterious the first time you see it, and it, it's kind of crazy. But the point is, this whole definition, this whole axiomatic setup of Rukiers comes from some very, very explicit examples where these quiver Hecker algebras, or later on affine Hecker algebras, are, are lurking in the higher structure of, of these, these functors. So really, the definition is, is there to axiomatize some very classical examples. And I'll show you some of those examples shortly. Um, so uh, th this is a, a very simple and practical way of thinking about the definition. There's, there's some functors which satisfy Serre relations on the Grothendi group, and then there's some natural transformations which satisfy quiver Hecker algebra relations. Um, but Rukier also gave uh, a different way of thinking about a categorical action. He introduced something which I call U hat of G, which is the Cax Moody two category. So there's some explicit two category. Uh, which is generated, the two morphisms are generated by these psi and, the psi and taus and the adjunctions here. And again, I'm not going to tell you the full relations for this Katz Moody 2 category, but it's something very explicit again, given, by, given diagrammatically by generators and relations. And Rukier proved that these two axioms that I'm using for categorical action are exactly the same as what you would get if you had a two representation of this Cax Moody two category. So this, this really this this is the right kind of algebraic structure that's being kind of somewhat sneakily encoded in, in these these two axes. They're really practical to check this way, whereas checking the relations of the Cax Moody two category can be kind of difficult. And maybe experts know that Kavanov and Lauder also introduced a two category which I call U of G, which very roughly is Rukier's two category with some extra relations imposed. The kavanov lauder two category is a quotient of the Rukier two category. And every now and then I'll talk about the notion of a strong categorical action. So that's a little better, the Rukier's notion of categor categorical action. So that means a two representation of the kavanov lauder two category. So these extra relations cyclicity and this Grassmannian relation that Kavanov and Lauder have, that, 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 that's needed for a strong action. It's much harder to check, whereas Rukier's <coughs> notion of categorical action, these two axioms are very practical. Okay, uh, so that's, that's the notion of categorical action, which is pretty much the same as in Eric's talk. I, I'm going to give examples in just a second. And actually, in these examples, I don't want to talk about quiver Hecker algebras. I want to talk about, instead of QH, I'm going to talk about AH, 
which for me is going to be the degenerate affine Hecker algebra. And uh, so these examples are all, all examples where you're in Cartan type A, and there's some coincidence that happens in Cartan type A where you can rephrase the definition of categorical action, getting rid of quiver Hecker algebras entirely and replacing them with affine Hecker. So it's entirely equivalent, but it's, it's going to be more convenient for, the, for all the examples I want to give. So let me just very briefly tell you what the, this, this special situation. So it's just the special case where the Kaxmudi algebra is either SL infinity or SL p hat. And that depends on p, which is the characteristic of the ground field we're working in. And then the set i that labels the simple roots should just be the image of the integers in k. So, so we have this, this, this special case where you can replace quiver Hecker with affine Hecker either SL infinity or SLP hat, according to the theory. And in that case, the, the definition of categorical action that I just gave, where you have EI and FI satisfying Sayer relations on the Grotten D group, and you have natural transformations, well, the natural transformation part, instead of xi and tau, you just need x and t, endomorphisms of f and f squared. You see here the, the pictures I draw for x, now it's just a dot and just a crossing. There's no colors anymore. So this kind of affine Hecker picture is sort of monochromatic, whereas the quiver Hecker algebra, all the strings were colored. Um, so these x and t then have to satisfy, instead of quiver Hecker relations, they have to satisfy the degenerate affine Hecker algebra relations. So here are the degenerate affine Hecker relations. They're very easy. So just, just the crossing squared is one, the usual braid relation for the symmetric group, and then the one extra relation about how a dot moves past a crossing, a dot moves past a crossing with an error term. So this is the only kind of interesting relation really. So this is much easier to, 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 to picture what all the relations for this are, whereas the Quebec algebra is a whole page's worth of relations. In addition, uh, Fi should be the generalized I eigenspace of x on the front end. So this is an equivalent formulation of the definition of categorical action in this special case where G is SL infinity or SLP. And the fact that it's equivalent to the definition on the previous slide is kind of a miracle. Um, in fact, underlying this equivalence of this definition with the earlier one is the fact that the quiver Hecker algebra and the degenerate affine Hecker algebra are essentially isomorphic. You have to pass to suitable completions, but once you do that, those algebras miraculously become isomorphic. So that's why I, I can reformulate the definition in this equivalent way. Okay, so. Those, that's the definition of categorical action. There's two ways, either in general, for general Cax Moody, where it's in terms of quiver Hecker algebras, or in this very special case, which is my favorite case, because it appears all over the place in classical representation theory. You can, refrain, you can phrase the higher structure of a categorical action in terms of affine Hecker algebra relations. OK, so I want to give examples straight away. So the first example was also in Eric's talk. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to be categorifying with this example, I'm going to try and categorify V of lambda. So lambda here is a dominant weight, so just some uh, non-negative linear combination of fundamental weights. And v of lambda is just the, in the highest, weight, the integrable highest weight module for the Cax Moody algebra G. So this is very general. Any any G works here. So we're trying to categorify V of lambda, and the theorem, which was also in Eric's talk, Kanga Kashiwara's theorem tells you exactly how to do it. There's this category, which is script V of lambda, which is the category of representations of QHD <coughs> upper lambda. So this QHD upper lambda, it's a quotient of the quiver Hecker algebra by some extra relation. And this is called the cyclotomic quiver Hecker algebra. And then if you look at represent, finite dimensional representations of all of these cyclotomic quiver Hecker algebras for all D, that gives the abelian category script V of lambda. And the theorem says that this script V of lambda admits a categorical G action for any Cax Moody G. And the functors E and F arise from restriction and induction between the dth and the d plus 1 cyclotomic quiver Hecker algebra. And moreover, with this structure, and you look at the complexified Grotten D group of V of lambda, that's canonically isomorphic to the integrable highest weight module of V lambda. So it's a sort of internal construction because we're using quotients of quiver Hecker algebras to construct these categories. Uh, and so it's kind of not surprising that this higher structure has some action of quiver Hecker algebras in it. Um, so, uh, in, in fact, most of this theorem is, is easy. The thing that's hard is that, I mean, induction is tensor, so it's left adjoint to restriction. The thing that's hard here is showing that the induction is right adjoint to tensor. 
And, and that was a stumbling block for a long time, and, and that was what Kang and Kashiwara really solved to, to kind of fill this, this gap. Uh, ben Webster has a, has a different proof of this, uh, and his proof um, shows further that these could be of lambdas are actually strong categorifications, so, so this, these extra kavanov lauda relations work. And, and as Eric said in his talk, if you're in the symmetric case and the ground fields are characteristic zero, then in this category, script B of lambda, if you look at the Indian convertible projectives, their classes give a basis for the highest weight module B of lambda. And uh, the Ramnil of Astro theorem says that the classes of these projective Indian convertibles is exactly the canonical basis, the sticks canonical basis. And let me also very briefly mention that if you have SL infinity or SLP hat, so my special case where I can use affine Hecker algebras instead, then of course you don't need to use cyclotomic quiver Hecker algebras, you can use cyclotomic affine Hecker algebras, these, these uh, cyclotomic Hecker algebras which are cyclotomic quotients of affine Hecker algebras instead. And in this case the whole story <coughs> recovers part of Ariki's categorification theorem which, which, was, which predates this, this stuff by, by at least 10 years. Okay, so that's the first example, this, this, this category script B of lambda, which categorifies this, this highest weight module. The second example is, is really even older, and it's, it's sort of an external example. There's no quiver Hecker algebras on the surface in this example, so I think it's much more satisfying. It's kind of a classical example where this structure was lurking. So I'm, I'm going to my, my type A situation. G is going to be SL infinity. That's my Kex Moody. And my ground field will just be the complex numbers. And uh, so we're trying to categorify, in fact, I'm going to try to categorify tensor space for the Lie algebra SL infinity. So let me let V be the natural representation of SL infinity. Okay, so SL infinity is just Z by Z matrices. The natural representation is just column vectors with entries indexed by Z. So it has a, it has a standard basis, just VI indexed by the integer. And the Chevrolet generators of SL infinity, EI sends VI plus 1 to VI, and FI sends VI to VI plus 1. Okay, so it's just matrices and column vectors. So here's the theorem. Um, so what's my abelian category going to be? It's going to be coming from category O for the general linear Lie algebra, GLN. Um, so it's a little confusing here. There's two, two type A Lie algebras around. There's SL infinity and there's GLN around. SL infinity is what's going to, is going to be acting on the category, and the category is coming from category O for the Lie algebra GLN. So this category C, it's uh, finitely generated representations of the Lie algebra GLN, which are locally finite over the upper triangular matrices, and semi-simple over the Cartan of diagonal matrices, and, and I want all the weights to actually just be integers here. So this is this, this category O, and the theorem says that the category O for GLN admits a categorical action. And so G is SL2? So G is SL infinity. But there's only one F. So remember, F is, is short for the direct sum of all the FIs, and the FIs will be indexed by Z. Okay? So I'm, I'm telling you what the direct sum of all the FIs is. And then to get FI back, you will take the generalized I eigenspace of X on that. So F is meant to be an endofunctor of category O for GLN. It's just given by tensoring with the module of column vectors for GLN. So just tensoring with this finite dimensional GLN module. That's certainly an endo functor category O. And then I need the, the E is of course the adjoint to that, so it's tensoring with the dual. And then I need the, the extra data of the, the higher structure. So X is endomorphism of F. So that means I've got to define an endomorphism of KN tensored any module M in category O. It just comes from the action of the Casimir tensor on that. That's an endomorphism. And T, that's an endomorphism of F squared, that just comes from the flip of the natural module tensor itself, just flipping the tensor there. Okay. Uh, and what is the weight decomposition for this case? So uh, let me tell you what the Grothendieck group looks like, and then you'll see what the weight decomposition is. So uh, of course it's category O, so it's a highest weight category. There are some standard modules, which are usually called Verma modules in this situation. And so if you want to look at the Grothendieck group of this category O, uh, it has a basis just given by the classes of the Verma modules. So I write delta of lambda for the class of Verma modules, so lambda will be some integral weight here. So the Grothendieck group then is actually exactly the nth tensor power of this natural G module B. So of course the nth tensor power has a basis given by n tuples of integers, because integers index the basis of V. 
and the weights are just n tuples of integers as well in coordinates. And, and this identification of the Grotendi group of category O with B tends N, the class of the Verma just corresponds to so this is just a monomial in, in the obvious basis of B tends N. So I think you have to shift by row there. That's what I'm going to say exactly. And so then you can understand exactly what the weight subcategories are of tensor space, and they correspond exactly to the blocks of category O. Um, Uh, and there's also uh, a, a kind of cute, co a, a cute uh, combinatorial observation here. Um, of course, we're looking at category O for GLN, so you know the casualistic conjecture tells you how to compute the projective indecomposable modules in terms of Verma modules. And you can translate that, that, that data about uh, casualistic polynomials coming from the casualistic conjecture um, to see that the classes of the indecomposable projectives correspond in, in the Grotten D group under this isomorphism, they correspond exactly to the canonical basis of V tensor N, which was defined by Lustig. So again, the PIMs correspond to the canonical basis, and that's just a reformulation of the cash time Lustig conjecture for the Lie algebra GLN. Okay, so that's just a couple of examples. That category O example, you know, that's, that's 40 years old, and, and it has this extra structure of categorical action lurking in the background. Okay, and so the, the, the next slide as well is also repeating stuff from Eric's talk. He introduced, he defined the notion of a minimal categorification. So V lambda, we're back to the general case, any G. A v lambda is the integrable highest weight rep module for dominant lambda. I'll, I'll call a categorical action a minimal categorification of V of lambda. If the Grotten D group is isomorphic to the V of lambda, so if it decategorifies to the highest weight module V lambda, and also, the weight subcategory C lambda corresponding to the highest weight. So that, that, that's the highest weight, weight subcategory of this category. It's just a copy of vector spaces. So it's just modules over the ground field. And the uh, example coming from those cyclotomic quiver Hecke algebras, that script V of lambda that I gave you earlier, is indeed a minimal categorification of that. So uh, the theorem of Rukier, which, which Eric also stated, so all minimal categorifications of V of lambda are equivalent. In a strong sense, in the right sense, which uh, intertwines the categorical action and the higher structure of those natural transformations. So they're strongly equivariant the equivalent. So this is kind of a unique list of minimal categorifications. And uh, so this is an important result, but it's really just the very, very first step in a very general structure theory for categorical actions which Rukier has developed. Um, so really, there's a, there's a Jordan Holder theorem. If you have a general categorical action, there's a Jordan Holder theorem describing a filtration of the category, and the sections uh, are isotypic categorifications of, of some direct sum of copies of V of lambda. So this, this this uniqueness of minimal categorifications is just a baby piece of uh, this general structure theory for categorical action, which is of course the whole point of, of, of setting up this axiomatic, axiomatic setting. And so the idea, actually, of doing this went back to Truong and Rukier, just a little history. Uh, and they just used this in the case of SL2 and this Jordan Holder theorem, this structure theory for categorification for SL2. They used it to construct an action of the braid group attached to the, the Cax Moody G on the uh, derived category of an arbitrary categorical action. So this means that you get lots of derived equivalences on, on, once you have a categorical action kind of for free from this, this setup. Uh, so they applied that um, to uh, the uh, minimal categorification in, in, my, in the SLP hat case, um, where you take just the fundamental <coughs> representation, V of omega zero for SLP hat. And in that case, the uh, category is, was, in general, it was representations of these cyclotomic Hecker algebras. But for omega zero, actually, the cyclotomic Hecker algebras just become the group algebras of the symmetric groups. And so V of omega zero is categorified by representations of symmetric groups in characteristic P. And using these, uh, this braid group action that you get on here, you get a ton of derived equivalences between blocks of different symmetric groups. And so this was a key ingredient that Chuang and Rukia used to prove Bruet's abelian defect group conjecture for the symmetric groups. And this is kind of the original motivation for setting up all these axioms and developing this structure theory was exactly to prove this. It's kind of a very cool story from about 10 years ago. Uh, I've, I've mentioned briefly strong categorical actions. The axiom that I gave you is easy to check, and it gives you a categorical action. Then there's these extra relations between the uh, natural transformations to get the Kavanov-Lauder 
two category, which gave the notion of strong categorical action. They're, they're harder to check in the sort of examples coming from representation theory. But in fact, all of those examples are known to have strong categorical actions. And you get some extra, stru extra structure whenever that happens. So I just mentioned a um, result recently of, of, uh, of these guys showing when you have a strong action, that the, the current algebra acts on the centers of the categories. So there's kind of extra structure that you get here. Kind of well worth fighting for strong categorical action. Uh, John, categorification and categorical action, is it the same? Same, same thing, yeah. I, I switch between the two. OK, so um, the rest of the talk, I want to talk about categorifying tensor products. So I, I already talked about categorifying irreducible highest weight representations. What about how to categorify some tensor product of irreducible highest weight representations? So really, I think that, that I mean, we have this notion of a categorical action. And uh, I think one of the main problems ongoing in this subject is how to find the notion of tensor product. So if you have two categorifications, how can you find a new categorification whose Grotten D group is the tensor product of the original ones? And this seems to be very hard, and I know Rukier has been thinking about it for a number of years, but, but it just seems to be very difficult. It's a very tantalizing problem. Uh, so I want to tell you about uh, some work of Losseff and Webster, who uh, didn't try to solve that problem, but instead tried to, write, to, tried to work out what sort of structure the categories that arise from this mythical tensor product should have. And so they wrote down a, a set of axioms that I'm about to tell you, which uh, tensor products of categorification should, should have this structure. So it's sort of a recognition theorem. How do you recognize a categorical action that should be a tensor product, even though you haven't got a categorical tensor product construction? So, this, so let, me, let me try and tell you this. It's a somewhat complicated definition, but I think it's very cool and very important. Um, so let me suppose I've got R dominant weights, lambda 1 through lambda R. And then I need some combinatorial data attached to these weights. So uh, remember, if you have a dominant weight, there's a highest weight crystal, B of lambda, which labels a basis of the highest weight module, B of lambda. So I'm going to let capital lambda be just the Cartesian product of the highest weight crystals, B lambda 1, B lambda 2, B lambda R. Okay, so this set will index some obvious monomial basis of the tensor product of those V of lambda i's. And xi here is also going to be the product of, so P of lambda means the set of weights of V of lambda. So xi is just R tuples of weights, a weight of V of lambda 1, a weight of V of lambda 2, and so on. And the set lambda, the, the, the Cartesian product of the crystals, obviously projects onto the Cartesian product of the set of weights just by taking weights. So the set lambda is going to index things like simple modules in our categorifications, whereas the set xi is going to have some poset structure on it. And the partial order that's relevant is called the reverse dominance ordering. So if you have one R tuple of weights and another R tuple, the, in the reverse dominance ordering, you look at the, the partial sums of the first tuple. That has to be greater than or equal in the usual dominance ordering on x to the, the corresponding partial sum of the new. So this, this lambda sitting over this poset psi, this is the basic combinatorial data that's needed to set up what a tensor product categorification is. OK, so here's the definition. A tensor product categorification, that's, that's what our Grotten D group's meant to look like. V lambda 1 tensored up to V lambda R. So it's one of these nice abelian categories with weight decomposition as before, equipped with a categorical action. Now, uh, the category C then has to be what's called a standardly stratified category. So this is a little complicated. It's a generalization of a highest weight category. We had that category O example before, which was indeed a tensor product categorification that happened to be highest weight. Standardly stratified is slightly more complicated. <coughs> so let me try and just very quickly give you the, the glimpse of what a standardly stratified category is. So to start with, there have to be some standard objects, delta of pi where pi runs over this set lambda that's going to index all the module families that we're going to be looking at. So there's some bunch of standard objects. Each of these standard objects should have simple top, which would be called L of pi. And the L of pi should give a complete set of simple objects in the category C. Now remember, lambda sits over this poset. So there's sort of <coughs> a pre-order on our set lambda, on these, on these pi's. So on the simple modules in this category, they're sort of ordered. 
So that means that you can define a filtration of this abelian category C. So C, if you have a xi in our process, C less than or equal to xi would be the SARE subcategory generated by the simple modules L of pi for all pi that are less than or equal to xi. So this, this post-set structure induces a filtration of this category. And I'll write C upper zero, this is the associated graded category. So the C less than or equal to xi and C strictly less than xi. And then this is the SARE quotient. And you take the direct sum of all the SARE quotients and you get this associated graded category, which is a direct sum of blocks indexed by xi by tuples of weights. Um, so uh, then, uh, of course, there's a quotient functor from C less than or equal to xi to this uh, quotient. And the quotient functors always have a left adjoint. This is the functor delta. Delta then is this left adjoint, which gives you a functor from the associated graded back to C. And, and this, so this is called the standardization functor. And uh, standardly stratified, part of the conditions for that is that the standardization functor needs to be exact. OK, so uh, this associated graded, its simple objects are also labeled by the set lambda. You get the simple objects in the, in the associated graded just by projecting the simple objects upstairs. So in C0, the simple objects are labeled by the same set. Now, the second part of the, actu of the axiom of tensor product categorification this associated grade, it has to have extra structure. And it has to have the extra structure as being a minimal categorification of the outer tensor product of these Vs. So I'm thinking of this tensor product not now as a G module, but as a G cross G cross G cross G module, one copy of G for each of the tensor factors. So then it's an irreducible highest weight module for G direct sum R. So that means there's a whole load of data. There's R different categorical actions of G, one in each tensor position. I'll call them F1, F2, and so on up to FR. So you have to have all that structure. And any minimal categorification, the simple modules are labeled by the underlying crystal, which is exactly this kind of <coughs> this outer product of crystals. And the labeling coming kind of canonically from crystal theory has to agree with the labeling coming from the standardly stratified structure. It's complicated, but there's only one more axiom. So you have to have standardly stratified structure upstairs. You have to have commuting action, or an action of R copies of G on the associated graded downstairs. And then finally, there has to be a relation relating the categorical action upstairs. That, that's, that's Fi upstairs. And then downstairs, there were, it was Fi in the first tensor position, and so on, Fi in the last tensor position. And the same one is that if you compose Fi with standardization, that has to be filtered, and the layers in the filtration have to be standardization composed with Fi1 downstairs and so on. And similarly for the other. So the thing you can uh, see from this easily, uh, let's look at the Grotendi group of the category C. Well, it's standardly stratified, so the Grotendi group of C is going to be the same as the Grotendi group of the delta filtered objects in C. And the standardization functor gives an isomorphism between the delta filtered objects and the Grotten D group of the associated graded C0. And the associated graded C0, its Grotten D group is this tensor product, this outer tensor product. And then the way Fi acts on here, th this last axiom comes in. Fi is going to act as the Fi's for each of these G's in that direct sum, but in each tensor position added up. That's exactly this, this filtration property. So this filtration property is somehow a categorical version of the co-multiplication of the R-fold co-multiplication of the Lie algebra. So when you have all this data, it's automatic that indeed the Grotten D group of C as a G module is the tensor product that you want. It's a complicated definition. It's the one difficult thing in this story is to say that definition. OK, so then there's uh, a, a, a beautiful uniqueness theorem that, that uh, Losseff and Webster managed to prove, which is generalization of Rukier's uniqueness for minimal categorification. So it's uniqueness for tensor product categorifications. So let me just quickly tell you this. So C is going to be a tensor product categorification of that tensor product. And I'll write lambda for the sum of the lambda i. So that's the absolute highest weight in sight in this, in this module. And then the, remember there was this capital lambda, which was the product of the crystals, that labels the simple objects in this category. In this category. <coughs> and now, Kashiwara's tensor product rule on this product of crystals, it gives you a crystal structure on that product, making that into a single G crystal. And I'm going to let lambda circle be the connected component of that G crystal 
generated by the highest weight vector. So that will be a copy of the highest weight crystal B of lambda sitting inside this tensor product of, of all those crystals. So this set lambda zero is important. It sits inside the set lambda. So now I've got my categorification C, and I'm going to let C bar be the quotient of C by the say, a subcategory. And I'm, so the simples I'm going to kill are all the simples in, in the product of crystals that are not in that top connected component. So in C bar, it's only going to be the L of pi's for pi and lambda 0 that survive when you pass to that quotient category. So it's really easy to see from the axioms that this C bar, this quotient of C, is indeed a minimal categorification of V of lambda. That was lambda the sum. So there's this quotient functor pi going from C to C bar, and this C bar is a minimal categorification of V of lambda, but minimal categorifications are unique. So this C bar doesn't depend on what, C, what tensor product categorification C was at all. And lots of webs to prove that this quotient functor has a double centralizer property. And this essentially means that you can recover the category C from the category C bar plus the extra data of what the projectives map to in C bar. And using this double centralizer property and using Rukier's uniqueness for minimal categorifications, they were able to soup it up to get that in fact any tensor product categorification of this tensor product is equivalent. This is the uniqueness for tensor product categorifications. So there's plenty of examples of tensor product categorifications coming from wildly different constructions in Lie theory. This is a very, very strong result, implying that wildly different categories constructed in very different ways from different places in the theory are actually equivalent in a very strong sense. It's a very, very useful theorem. Um, that's uniqueness. Webster proved existence of tensor product categorifications earlier using his tensor product algebras. And, and in particular, that shows that any tensor product categorification is strong, which is kind of intriguing to me. Uh, uh, actually, in, in, I never use Webster's construction of existence because in the type A examples that I'm interested in, um, there's another construction of tensor product categorifications based on parabolic category, uh, which I'll show you in just a second. <laughs> okay, so there's existence and uniqueness of tensor product categorifications. Uh, so now I want to just move on to just another special source of a bunch of examples of tensor product categorifications, which I'm going to call minuscule tensor product categorifications. So this is just another special family. So I'm going to go to this SL infinity situation now, moving away from the general Kax movie. So my ground fields C and G will be SL infinity. I think I called V the natural module of SL infinity before. I'm now going to call it V upper zero. And V upper one is going to be the dual natural module for SL infinity. So the sort of module that I'm interested in now, I can, I can take V zero and I can look at some exterior power of V zero. So that's some minuscule representation of SL infinity. It's not highest weight. It's not lowest weight. It's level zero. And I can do the same with V1. I can look at some exterior power of V1, another level zero minuscule representation. And I'm going to just fix some tensor product of some exterior powers of V0 and V1. So there's the data. There's some n's and the c's and zeros and ones. So it's just some tensor product of wedges of V0s and V1s, V's and V2s. Let's let m be just some such SL infinity module. So I'm going to consider the problem of trying to categorify M. So it's a tensor product. So it's going to be some sort of, some sort of tensor product categorification. This, is, this M is an integral module of SL infinity. But as soon as you have Vs and V stars showing up, um, the uh, weight spaces in this module start being infinite dimensional. So we're in a slightly more general setting than before. And if you think about the reverse dominance ordering for this tensor product, you start to get a post set where the chains can be infinite in both directions. And so this causes all sorts of problems that, that mean that the earlier setting, the earlier axioms of tensor product categorification that I wrote down don't quite work. There's some finiteness lost. Uh, and so you just, you just need to be a little bit, it's somehow not really a big deal, but it, it, you, have to just, you have to work a little bit to get the definition right. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so uh, the, the theorem of myself and Lossip and Webster, uh, it, it fix M. Tensor product categorifications of M with this slightly souped up notion of tensor product categorification since we've lost some finiteness exist and are unique in exactly the same sense as in the previous uniqueness theorem for tensor products of highest weight modules. These aren't tensor products of highest weight modules, so it's a, it's a new theorem. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that other part of the theorem in a minute. Um, SL infinity, it's the direct limit of SLNs. 
This module M, it's a direct limit of modules for SLNs, which are just integrable highest weight modules. And the previous uniqueness of Lossip and Webster already gives you uniqueness for, for finite SLN. So you can kind of guess what's going on. Just as SL infinity or M is a direct limit of finite ones, if we have a tensor product categorification of this, it's a, in, in a categorical way, it's going to be, so we, we pass to some subquotients and take a careful direct limit using the uniqueness in the finite SLN case. It's, it's quite a subtle argument to prove existence and uniqueness, but it's really building on the previous result together with some kind of new ingredients involving kind of categorical direct limit constructions. Um, not only do the tensor product categorifications of M exist and are unique, uh, I haven't talked at all about gradings. Eric talked a little bit about gradings in his talk. Um, the the affine Hecker algebra is, is not a very nice object from the point of view of gradings, but the quiver Hecker algebra is great. This, this uh, Rukier Cax Moody 2 category, U hat of G, because the generators admit are homogeneous. There's a, there's a Z grading on there with, with respect to which the generators are homogeneous. And so once you have that, you can talk about graded categorical actions. So that the two morphisms in Rukier's two category act, so, so a, a graded category, like modules over a graded algebra. Uh, so that the two morphisms act homogeneously. And uh, so part of our uniqueness theory, we prove not only do they un the, the tensor product categorification of this M exist and are unique, but moreover, any such has a unique graded lift to a graded two representation. And moreover, <laughs> that unique graded lift turns out to be a Kazool grading on that. It's, it's coming from some Kazool algebra. So this is kind of a, a, a theory of kind of gluing together a whole bunch of things kind of that, are, that are fine and were well known and classical for finite SLN. They go back, the causality goes back to Baines and Ginsburg and Zergel, and taking a clever limit argument to, to get to this general set. Okay, so existence and the uniqueness of these minuscule tensor product categorifications, they have unique graded lifts, that graded lift is Kazool. So let me talk just about existence. So I'm going to give a construction now, an explicit construction of a tensor product categorification of M. So that's the data, it's all fixed still. <coughs> M is as on the previous slide. Here's the construction of the tensor product categorification. They're all, they're, they're, they're all, the, they're all equivalent, so I just need to construct one of them. <coughs> so it's, this is very much like the category O example I gave earlier, except now I'm going to consider not the Lie algebra GLN, but I'm going to consider a Lie super algebra, GLN1, N2, NR. Remember, those were the, the powers in the exterior powers that we were taking. So this is going to be a Lie super algebra. So N1, N2 up to NR, I'm going to think of this as some sort of block matrices with R blocks. And I want the IJ block to be of size NI by NJ. And the Z2 grading on this thing, the parity of the, of the, of the entries supported in the IJ block is going to be CI plus ZJ. Remember, these Cs were either zeros or ones. So this is some uh, GLMN um, written in a slightly non-standard basis. And I want to take the standard parabolic of block upper triangular matrices in here. And then you could, this is just, this, this just a parabolic category O associated to this Lie super algebra and that block upper triangular parabolic. And the theorem says that the category O integrable part for that parabolic in that Lie super algebra admits a categorical action. It's defined just the same way as the GLN example from earlier, which is just a special case of this. So the functor F is gotten by tensing with the natural module for this Lie algebra. The uh, endomorphism X comes from the Casimir tensor for this Lie super algebra and so on. And moreover, the Grotten D group of this categorification is exactly that M that I had before. In fact, this is a tensor product categorification of M in the sense of the, of the uniqueness theorem that I just stated. Uh, so the standard objects, and this is, this is the highest weight category, the standard objects are just parabolic Verma modules here, and they categorify the obvious monomial base, the tensor products of wedges in, in, in M. And uh, the fact that there's a Kazool grading here is very strong, and it kind of quite easily implies that the classes of the indie conversable projectives in this categorification correspond exactly to the Lustig canonical basis for, for this module M in the previous slide. And in fact, the Kazool grading it lets you put a Q in to all your Grotten D groups, and you can actually see this canonical base not specialized at Q equals one, which is what I intended when I wrote this, but you can actually interpret the Q and, and have quantum groups coming in as, as, as acting on the Grotten D groups of your categorifications. 
So this, this uh, proves this consequence of all these uniqueness results. It proves something which uh, a conjecture I formulated a few years ago, the super cash dynasty conjecture for the Lee super algebra GLNM. It's not the first proof, of, but Cheng Lam and Wang proved it already about three years ago. Um, but the, uh, the point of this proof is it incorporates this, this Kazool grading, which uh, it, it tells you what the cues in the quantum groups needed to define these canonical bases are doing in the world. Okay, do I have a couple of minutes? Or no? uh, two minutes. Two minutes is perfect. Yeah, I have only one more slide. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I've talked about tensor product categorifications of various sorts. So we, we talked about tensor products of highest weight modules, where there's the original uniqueness theorem. And then these minuscule tensor products that I'm looking at here that seem to come naturally from category O for the Lee super algebra GLNM, these are not highest weight modules, but they're still minuscule representations of SL infinity. Um, you know, with, once we have this notion of a tensor product categorification, you can start taking lots of naturally occurring categories and you start seeing this structure of uh, this, this standardly stratified structure, this associated graded, um, this, this, this kind of recognition axioms that Lossip and Webster have given us. And you start seeing lots of naturally occurring categories that are actually tensor product categorifications in some sense. Remember, this, this notion of tensor product doesn't exist at the categorical level. But still, there's loads of examples that really should be there. Um, and I just wanted to finish with just so this example was, was category O for the Lee super algebra GLMN. But the last slide, I just want to give you uh, one last example, maybe very quickly. Um, so uh, this last example, I'll talk about what it is in just a second. What's it, what's it categorifying, whatever this category is? It's going to admit a categorical action of SL infinity or SLP hat, depending on the field, making it a tensor product of categorification of this guy. So V of omega zero, that's the, at the highest weight module of highest weight omega zero for SL infinity. And V of minus omega minus delta, that's a lowest weight representation. So this is a lowest weight integral module tends to the highest weight integral module. Overall, it's at level zero, but it's the lowest tends at highest weight. And this category that, I, that is up here, it's exactly going to be a tensor product categorification of this new sort, lowest. So this is minuscule, this is minuscule, but it's lowest and highest. So it's a kind of even more exotic example, but it really arises very much in nature. Uh, so what, what is, is the category that it, it involved is uh, representations of something that I call the oriented Brouwer category, OB and delta. And uh, the oriented Brouwer category, very quickly, it's just the free symmetric monoidal category generated by an object, which I denote as an up arrow, and its dual, which I denote as a down arrow. And this object has to have categorical dimension delta, which is just some integer. Uh, so normally when you think about OB delta, you just draw it diagrammatically. Uh, so the morphism, so the objects are sequences of ups and downs, and then a morphism, say, from this sequence of ups and downs to this sequence of ups and downs, you just draw as some sort of uh, diagram with, with some sort of string diagram where the arrows make the strings oriented in a sensible way. And composition of diagrams is just vertical stacking when it makes sense. Whenever you get a little floating bubble, you replace it by the parameter delta. And uh, then the tensor product is just horizontal stacking. This is usual calculus for one categories. Uh, so this is, this is a k-linear category OB delta. Maybe people know the Karubi envelope of OB delta better. It's called the Lean's category rep GL delta. So this is a tensor category. So the point is, this, this guy, it, it, it emits a categorical action, making it into this lowest weight, tensor highest weight, tensor product categorification. That's a level one, tensor level one. There's also the higher level, hence the highest level, the higher level. Let me end that. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. In your minuscule example, N1 and 2 and 3 were symmetrical, right? But in your cutting verification, N1 and 3 and 5 Odd ends and even ends have play very different rules. No, so there was no symmetricness going on. I, I Four slides back. That's gone. Can I have the slides back? The, the N1, N2, they were just arbitrary positive integers. C1, C, they could have been zero. The Cs could have been zero, 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 one, one, one. I guess my notation GL N1 slash N2 is, is confusing. You, you, you had lambda and one tensor, lambda and two tensor, lambda. Yes. 
So in, the, in this type of product, they are symmetric. Maybe it's better to do it. Hmm? It's a little technical. It's different, okay. different uh, category of O, I guess. It's how you... It's a, I've got, I've got V's and V stars, so yeah. it's some wedge of V's and some wedge of V stars. And each time you change from V to V star, that's where you need a parity switch in the new super algebra. Okay. okay, so let's thank the speaker again.